who was killed in a crash up in the skies. And, and, you know, the parents had no idea what she was talking about because she didn't, they didn't know who Kalpana Chala was. Now, I'll show you a picture of the child um, who, who says uh, that she died in this uh, crash. This is uh, Yupasana. This is the girl that recounts this um, previous life and says so she's in, reincarnated. And this is Kalpana Chala, who was the Indian, Indian astronaut who flew with the American astronauts on that shuttle, uh, whatever, uh, that was destroyed on its way back from whatever and, and, and died. Uh, and, and what we see here in our next slide is some information about Kapana Shala. Um, she was born March 7th, 1962 and died February 1st, 2003. An Indian-born American astronaut and space shuttle mission specialist. She was one of seven crew members lost aboard space shuttle Columbia during mission 107 when the shuttle disintegrated upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Kalpana Chawla is the posthumous recipient of the Congressional Space <coughs> Medal of Honor. So, you know, a very uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, uh, astronaut who died. And now here's this child saying that that's who she was in a previous life. Now, if someone would say to me, do you believe that? Well, then I'd have to say, well, you know, of course, I do believe it. Because what would I have to gain by saying I don't believe it? Uh, if I say, well, you know, I don't believe that, all I'm doing then would be aligning up with the majority that have no idea about anything, you know. Because you'll, you'll find uh, most people really, you know, couldn't deal with that, couldn't believe it. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to join them until, so to me, uh, in as much uh, as that's the story, I'm, I'm fine until somebody can prove otherwise. Um, I went through several situations in the Bible last week where the subject of reincarnation is handled very matter-of-factly. There was the case of Elijah who went up on a spaceship and, he, and, and this other guy standing there watching him and he disappears up into the sky and then in the New Testament it turns around and Jesus says, see John the Baptist over there, that's Elijah. Well, you know, that's a case of reincarnation. Uh, he goes up into the sky as Elijah and reappears as just John the Baptist. Of course, that's all mythology too. But a point is, is trying to be made. The second thing was the case of Jesus and his disciples walking down the street and, and they see a man who was born blind from birth and the disciples say, uh, who did this guy sin that caused him to be born blind? Well, Jesus didn't say, well, yeah, how could somebody sin before they were born? Uh, he just said, no, not in this case. So, uh, again, that was a statement of a belief in reincarnation of the disciples of Jesus. I mean, there's no way the church can get around that. They asked, the man was born blind, did he sin before he was born, and is that what caused him to be blind? So, uh, you know, they believed in reincarnation, obviously. Uh, and, and then the, uh, what we looked at here uh, last week, too, was the book of Ecclesiastes. And I want to look at this one more time because this, you know, this kind of melts into the whole thing. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. In other words, what happened in the past is going to happen again. Well, that could also be who happened in the past. That person is going to happen again. That which is done is that which shall be done. So there is this cycle of repetition. And there is no new thing under the sun. Nothing is new. Even people are not new. Nothing. See, look at this. There is no new thing under the sun. It doesn't say uh, people who were born are new. It says, no, there is no new thing. Nothing is new. Is there anything where I've maybe said, see, this is new? Well, I said, well, as a baby. See, let's, 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 say, let's, say, let's look at this question. Is there anything where I've maybe said, see, this is new? Well, you could take... Here you go to the hospital and say, oh, look, it's a brand new baby. No, it has already been of all time. 
which was before. Nothing is new. See? All the babies lined up, you know, there are going to be people who were before. That's what this is saying. That's what this is saying. This is a Bible you, you, you carry around. There is no remembrance of former things, and that's in most cases true. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. So in other words, as new people are, are born, and they have children who are born, nobody's going to remember that which was in the past. So what is that, what is that saying? That scripture in the Bible, whether it's right or wrong, you decide. But I mean, all these people are carrying around Bibles, and if you tell them reincarnation, oh no, there's no such thing. Well, then rip that page out. I forget, I don't know what number the page is on, but I will let you know so you can rip it out. Because that's evidently bad for you to see. Because that's saying that everything must reincarnate. Everything must reincarnate. Now, you notice the connection when it says there's no remembrance, but could it be that under some unusual and limited circumstances, one can remember something, such as this little girl from India? And we'll touch on that. And, and we then covered uh, the brilliant minds of Pythagoras and Plato. Both wrote about reincarnation as a natural fact. Now, reincarnation, say, either in belief or disbelief depends on the teachings that the person who is being told about it has had. I mean, if you go through a Christian church and you're a member of the group and you sing, this is the day or the Lord has made and all that stuff, you don't believe it. You don't. Because the group says, don't believe it. It doesn't mean that you know there is no such thing. All it means is, I've been told by my pastor and my group that it's not true. And so I can't believe it. All right? Now, uh, people who express an opinion that they do not believe in reincarnation, and you may be one of them watching, are actually saying that their group doesn't believe in it, and they have been taught not to believe in it. See? And people that do believe in reincarnation generally are people who have been exposed to Eastern thought or are not involved with organized religious groups. Basically, people who are free thinkers. You can't prove it happened. You can't prove it didn't happen. So how can you say, you know, I believe it, I don't believe it. You know, my, my position is, yeah, it's okay with me. If that's what they say, I believe it, until somebody proves otherwise, which, which may happen. One of the great writers in old Russia was a guy named Leo Tolstoy. And he wrote a magnificent uh, book called War and Peace that was made into, um, uh, uh, you know, a movie. Uh, gosh, I think it was one of these, you know, Gone with the Wind four-hour movies. But uh, this is what um, Leo Tolstoy uh, said. This, that's Leo. Uh, and he said, and in Russia, the eminent Count Leo Tolstoy wrote, as we live through thousands of dreams in our present life, so is our present life only one of many thousands of such lives which we enter from the other more real life and then return after death. Our life is but one of the dreams of that more real life. And so it is endlessly until the very last one, the very real life, the life of God. That comes from the Moscow Magazine, The Voice of Universal Love. So here's a... The, and, and what I wanted to try to do is kind of line up the people who support the possibility or theory of reincarnation uh, and then, uh, you know, take those who, who would not, you know. But this man was, is a brilliant writer. It doesn't mean he's right, but he's a brilliant mind. So what I'm saying is that Leo Tolstoy was the type of mind that would receive into himself things that are, 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 are new and, and beyond the, the ability of the average person to really deal with, say. And I, I like his approach because I am convinced that when you enter into the dream state, you're actually entering into another one of your many lives in a parallel universe. You know. 
uh, that you have had dreams, and, and you, do, you still do, and some in particular are so real. You know, you can see writings, you can see packages, you, you can see, I mean, things that are so absolutely real that you, you could have saying, you, know, you wipe your, you were, you were someplace. And that's what he is saying. As we live through thousands of dreams in our present life, so is our present life right now only one of the many thousands of such lives that we enter into. It, because it's all the same thing. There is nothing new, you see. And, and uh, it, so you are entering into another one of your lives in a parallel universe. The dream is actually not a dream, but a real experience that makes itself apparent when the physical body shuts down. And the physical body can shut down in sleep, and all of a sudden, you're you're in such, you're 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 meeting people. You're talking to people. You're doing different things. You may be driving or whatever, working whatever. But something real is going on. Say. And and it, and it, and it you know you, if if you're not going to take that, then you're going to have to say that the stuff inside of your skull, which you know I don't lose the word meat, but I mean you know the stuff inside of your skull is making up all of this stuff. Well, that's ridiculous. Because when you go into these dreams and you're into these experiences, you know you've never been to those places before. So how could it make them up? Okay. So if this be the case, then reality fits in and out to a variety of different places and different experiences. Because when one dreams, the activity may be with different people at different places every night. You know, just, just give the concept like uh, some of the scientists have taught us. You might have many, many um, uh, twins in parallel universes. And so how many of there are, are you? How many, of, how many twins do you have? Because it seems like when you dream every night, you're, you're at a different place with different people doing something different. But if that be the case, that when you, your body shuts down in sleep, you are very much alive in, in, in some kind of an encounter, then that same power would have to exist when the body shuts down in death. The person simply slips from one reality into another reality. That's a very exciting concept. And, and you know, we, we, we've heard this from a very brilliant mind from old Russia, Leo Tolstoy. Say. I can't even conceive of such a thing as the human brain creating all of these events because it's a computer. And, and a computer needs input from a person. No matter how sophisticated. And the human brain is a much more sophisticated computer than any computer that exists. I'll grant you that. But nonetheless, it's up to you as to what you tell your brain to do. If I tell my brain uh, to lift my right hand, but if I don't want to, I could tell my brain, uh, I, you know, I don't want to lift my right hand and it's not going to go up. So something has to be input. And that's what he's talking about. And, and as far as Christian people are concerned, they can't accept reincarnation. Why? Because they're told not to. That's like, uh, you know, we got uh, dogs and cats, and we say, hey, no, 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 and uh, they don't do it. Sorry. But it's nothing more than that. People are told in church, reincarnation is wrong, don't believe in it, you can't believe in it. So you ask, oh, no, I don't believe in that. But intelligent people throughout history had a different opinion. And that's what I wanted to try to bring to you. See? So, I mean, do you want to put... You, you tell me if you want to put uh, the one who told you that reincarnation uh, is evil or wrong, do you want to put that person on, on the same level with, with the people I'm about to show you? And, and, and that's what. So let's look at, at some of the folks who, who had a different peop, a per, uh, idea about me. This guy's Benjamin Franklin. You know? 
can see him on top of the building. And, and he says, I look upon death to be as necessary to the Constitution as sleep. We shall rise refreshed in the morning. And finding myself to exist in the world, I believe I shall, in some shape or other, always exist. That's Benjamin Franklin. He's a pretty intelligent guy. I think he's more intelligent than most of the people who say you're not allowed to believe in it. Right? Here's another thing. And, and when I was a kid, I used to read his stories. You know, it, you know, his name is Jack London. And Jack London wrote some of the great stories of the great Northwest. There was one story I read, and I was only a kid, but I couldn't put it down. And, and he wrote this story about things going on up in Alaska and uh, gold mines and all that stuff. Jack London said this, and, and he was a brilliant writer. I did not begin when I was born, nor when I was conceived. I have been growing, developing through incalculable myriads of millenniums. All my previous cells have their voices, echoes, promptings in me. All incalculable times again shall I be born. Jack London. You know? So, I mean, I've given you two people. Okay? And I say, hey, Pretty, pretty responsible, pretty sophisticated people who said that... And you see, this is the thing. When people get to be this successful in their various uh, uh, work, they are people who are inspired. There's an inspiration that comes to them. Or they couldn't do the things that they did. And when the inspiration comes to them, that's coming from what we call God or the higher. And, and this is what they say. Let's see who else, uh, who else we can bring up here. here. Here is Mark Twain. And Mark Twain says, I have been born more times than anybody except Krishna. But he's a brilliant writer. Who, who doesn't read Mark Twain? Who, who doesn't quote Mark Twain? Uh, Mark Twain. <laughs> I, I got a. This is. You know who this is? Many of you drive his car. Henry Ford. And Henry Ford said, I adopted the theory of reincarnation when I was 26. And this. Now listen very carefully to what he says. And this is really a neat thought. Genius, in other words, really being able to do something, is experience. Some people think. It's a gift or a talent. But it's not. It is the fruit of long experience in many lives. What a brilliant thing. You see? And so what he's saying is, you know, I wasn't just born here and all of a sudden I knew how to make cars and I'm going to invent cars and all this stuff. No. This was something that went on inside of me for many, many lifetimes. And, and so w when I got to this lifetime, I had enough that, hey, you know, I was, I was able to do this. And I think that, that comment by uh, Henry Ford is really good. We're going to look at a very famous playwright and scientist by the name of Johann van Gogh and then a German philosopher, Friedrich Nitzke. But uh, van Gogh says, as long... Now, get this. This is what he says, and it's so true. As long as you are not aware of the continual law of die and be again, you are merely a vague guest on a dark earth. Wow! Isn't that something? In other words, you're missing the whole thing! And that's what people, they go into church and they don't know because they said you can't believe in this thing. Frederick Nietzsche, this philosopher, said, live so that you may desire to live again. That is your duty. For in any case, you will live again. You know? So, I mean, what they're saying, and w what Nietzsche says was, hey, you know, you're going to live again, so, so learn and learn and learn so that the next time, uh, you know, you come and you got this knowledge and you'll be stronger with it. And, and, and you know, and you could say, oh, well, I'm not going to worry about that. Well, you will, because you're going to live again. One of the great minds from uh, India in the, in the East is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, I mean, uh, my God, a brilliant mind and a person that just by sitting there overthrew a, a great uh, occupying power like England. And this is what he says. He said, I cannot think 
of permanent enmity between man and man, and believing as I do in the theory of reincarnation, I live in the hope that if not in this birth, in some other birth, I shall be able to hug all of humanity in friendly embrace. See? It's so much, it, it, is, it is so much better, so, so encouraging to be around these people, wouldn't it? Than to be around the nuts that, you know, run the shows that we are. But here's one, of the, here's one of the great ones. This is one of the best statements I have ever heard about reincarnation. And you know who this is? This is a, a famous American poet by the name of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay, and this is what he said. The soul comes from without into the human body as into a temporary abode. And it goes out of it anew. It passes into other habitations. For the soul is immortal. It is the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterwards return again. Nothing is dead. Men feign themselves dead and endure mock funerals. And there they stand looking out of the window, sound and well, in some strange new disguise. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Hey, can you imagine your, oh, when you're wiping your eyes, looking into a casket, oh, look at Uncle Charlie, oh. And he said, but no, Uncle Charlie's looking out the window, sound and well in some strange new disguise. I think that is just great. But these, you see, so, so your pastor or whomever or your friends, oh, I don't believe in that. But these, these are brilliant, brilliant, inspired. Ralph Waldo Emerson was an inspired mind. And if he was inspired to write the things that he did, then wouldn't he be inspired to uh, uh, understand the things, the higher things of what we call God? Now, in order to, to move along, there are other things, but in order to move along, I've kind of put them all on one. I'll read their statements to you, but I put their pictures on, on, on one uh, one slide. So let's take a look. And the first one we're going to look at is General George Patton. Uh, there's General Patton. He was a, he was a tough guy, uh, but you know, this is this is what he said. So as through a glass and darkly the age-long strife I see, where I fought in many guises, many names, but always me. Now uh, the next one we're going to look at is um, another an English poet laureate named William Wordsworth. And I know uh, all in your schools, but, but he said this in his, in his poet poetical way, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, has had it elsewhere its setting and comes from afar. Now, Next, we'll, we'll, we'll look at Socrates, and, and you all know Socrates, the, the great philosopher of classic Greece. And he says, I am confident that there truly is such a thing as living again, that the living spring from the dead, and that the souls of the dead are in existence. And then uh, one of the great writers, uh, I guess from France, Voltaire, I mean, who... Who hasn't, you know, in, in some drama or something, somebody quoted uh, Voltaire. And this is what he said. It is not more surprising to be born twice than once. Everything in nature is resurrection. Isn't that great? And here's a surprise. The Koran. We hear so much of this now with all of the Muslim and so forth. And this is what the Koran says. God generates beings and sends them back over and over again till they return to him. That's from the Koran. And then the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer says, were an Asiatic to ask me for a definition of Europe, now he's going to get sarcastic here, I should be forced to answer him, it is that part of the world which is haunted by the incredible delusion that man was created out of nothing and that his present birth is his first entrance into life. 
So, so what he's saying is, somebody from the East that knows about reincarnation, I would tell them, I come from Europe where they don't know anything. Now, look at these minds. I, yeah, I'm not a fan of this guy, but, but still in all, he was a brilliant war tactician. William Wordsworth, poet laureate, Socrates, Voltaire, uh, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, Fla these minds that say, yes, you're stupid if you don't understand that uh, uh, people uh, are reincarnated. And there's one more. There is one more, and he is part of the Beatles. And his name is George Harrison, who has since passed away. And George Harrison said this, Friends are souls that we have known in other lives. We're drawn to each other. Even if I have only known them a day, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to wait till I have known them for two years because anyway, we must have met somewhere before, you know. And that's what you know, he said. So, all of these people, and I could find many more. I could find Carl Jung and others that believe... But all of these people, very distinguished, all people who were inspired, as was George Harrison as a musician, as was Voltaire, as was Wordsworth, all of these people received an enlightenment into their minds, or they couldn't have written as they do. And they look at you and say, if you don't realize that you cannot die, but that reincarnation is true and you will be back and your life will continue. If you don't realize that, you're living in darkness. You're, you're, you're stupid. See? And, and so all of these people would join the scientists who speak of parallel universes and are twins in those universes. And any reluctance to consider this reincarnation phenomena is simply caused by your mind which has been conditioned by religion. I can't prove anything. I can't st stand up here and say, well, you know, I believe. I, I'm simply, I feel that, yes, I feel it's true, but I can't, I'm not here to convince you of anything. But what I like to do about these subjects that get... Um, controversial with religion is bring you scientists who, 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 who say otherwise and that we should give this stuff second thought. And of course these gifted people who are uh, enlightened and inspired by a higher element of some kind to do things that the average person can't do. The average person uh, cannot write like a Voltaire or, or Wadsworth or Ralph Waldo Emerson or whatever. These are way above average people. And they're telling us that their opinion is that reincarnation is true. And that brings us to the story of the boy who lived before. And now, you see, we've got something going here because look, look at all of the people uh, that have uh, said you should look at this because this is true. You know, I didn't show you any people here who were New Age, or whatever you want to call it, or, you know, smoking anything. I, I showed you people with extremely high credentials as gifted minds. So, given that, then I think it should elevate the story to you. Because when you have very prestigious people who testify to their belief in reincarnation, how can we laugh off the little girl who said she, she in another life was the astronaut that died? Because Voltaire, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Mahatma Gandhi, all these people say, oh yes, that's right. No, we can laugh, and what are we? We're just ignorant. It's like people who laughed at Alexander Graham Bell or, or the guy, the Wright brothers, or any of those people. There's always people to laugh and say, oh, that's stupid. But then it winds up they're stupid. But this is something that is the most important thing in your life. It talks about you, your destination, what's going to happen to you, and it should encourage you. But you have to throw off 
the nonsense of superstitious religion in order to become part of it. How do you just flat out say that these types of things as, as that little girl in India can't happen when a Dr. Jim Tucker and Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia who have carried out investigations for years that scientifically confirm indeed it can be. See? Who'd you have in your church that could speak to Dr. Tucker and Ian Stevenson in the University of Virginia and say oh you're, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. What do you say when they sit down and come out with the documentation? Now I want to show you a picture of a boy who claims to have lived before and I'm going to provide you the details. He, his name is Cameron McCauley and he lives in Glasgow, Scotland. And, and, and this is his picture. This is Cameron McCauley. And this boy in Scotland knows where he lived who his parents were, what kind of car his father had, uh, the fact that they had a little black and white dog, and he has spent years uh, telling his friends and his mother, and he, his, his, his concept was, I have to get back to my family because they miss me. I don't want my mother to be crying because she doesn't know where I'm at. See? He was, right there, he's six years old. He was a typical six-year-older in, in Scotland, and he was, but he was always talking about his mother and his family. And he liked to draw pictures of his house, a, a single-story white house standing by the bay. But it, it shent, shivers down his mother's spine because Cameron said it was somewhere that they had never been, 160 miles away from where he lives. And he said the mother he was talking about was his other mother. And he was convinced he had lived a previous life and this worried, he was so worried that his, his family would be missing him. And, and this is where he said he lived. The, Cameron said he lived in that little white house on the Isle of Barra in Scotland. His mother, Norma, who was 42 years old, said ever since Cameron could speak, he's come up with tales of childhood on the Isle of Barra. It's very similar to the little girl in India. Ever since she could speak, she's talking about being this astronaut. And, 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 and Norma, his, his, his mother now, said he spoke about his former parents. He spoke how his dad died. He spoke about his brothers and sisters. And eventually, we just had to take him there and see what we could find. It was an astonishing experience. She said, we didn't know what to do. But she said, neither of our families, either my family or my ex-husband's family, have ever been to the Isle of Barra. And she says, at first, we, do, we did what all people do. We, we put the stories down to a vivid, you know, childish imagination. But she said, then, as the child got older, he, he be started to become bitter and extremely distressed at being away from his family. As if like he, he had been kidnapped or something. And, and Norma, his mother, said it went on for years and, and people tried to help and doctors and everybody. When he started in nursery school, she said, his teacher called Norma, his mother, and told her all the things that little Cameron was saying about the Isle of Barra and, and that he missed his mother and his brothers and sisters there. She said he missed playing on the beach beside his house. And this is cute. He, he complained that in the present house he lives in Glasgow, there's only one t bathroom, whereas in Barra they had three. But he, he used to cry for his mother and said, 
she'd be missing him and he wanted to let his family know he was okay. And she said it was very distressing. And, and she said that he wouldn't stop talking about that place and, and he, he would tell him he used to watch the planes landing on the beach from his bedroom window. And he even named his father. He said his dad was called Shane Robertson. And he said he died because he didn't look both ways. And one day the nursery teacher told Norma that a film company were looking for people who believed they had lived before. So she got in touch with them and she said the family was horrified. There was a lot of opposition to it, but I'm a single parent, she said. So it was me and, and Cameron's brother Martin uh, that we were badly affected by this. And Cameron continued to beg to take him to the Isle of Barra. And so she contacted the film company and they followed Cameron's journey to Barra and part of this film company was attached to the University of Virginia and child psychologist Dr. Jim Tucker. And Dr. Jim Tucker accompanied them to the Isle of Barra. Which lends to me great credibility. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tucker, as you know, specializes in, in, in child reincarnation and has researched other child children like Cameron. Um, now that's an important part of the story because Dr. Tucker is a resident psychologist and professor at the University of Virginia who worked with the late Ian Stevenson on researching children who claimed to have lived before. So he's an extremely credible person. Let's go back and look at, at the house again. Uh, so anyhow, when Cameron, the child, was told that they were going to go to Barra, she said he was jumping all over the, the place. And so the family flew from Glasgow and landed on Cockleshell Bay, on the Isle of Barra, an hour later. And uh, Norma said, uh, his mother said that as they were getting off the plane, Cameron says, asked if his face looked shiny because he was so happy. And uh, they got to the place and they landed near a beach. And uh, they said, Cameron looked at them and said, now do you believe me? And he got off the plane and he threw his arms up in the air and said, I'm back. And he talked about his bar mother and that she had brown hair down to her waist, but she had cut it. And he was so anxious to meet her. So the, the Mulcahy's was Cameron booked into a hotel and you know, began to, to check around, I guess, with Dr. Tucker. And they contacted the Heritage Center and asked if they heard of a Robertson family who lived in a White House overlooking the bay, and they hadn't. And Cameron was disappointed, and, and they drove around the island, but they never saw the house. But then uh, they realized, whoever was doing the investigation, that if he had seen planes land on the beach, they were driving the wrong way. And the next day, the family received a call from uh, somebody at the desk at the hotel, said that they were able to confirm that a family called Robertson did once have a White House on the bay. And that information was given to, to Jim Tucker. And so Norma said that with Dr. Tucker, they decided we're not going to tell Cameron anything. Because, you know, Dr. Tucker has got to try to document. So they drove towards where they were told the house was and waited to see. And he recognized it immediately. That's it, that's it, that's it. But as they walked to the door, the color drained from his face. He became very quiet because his mother said that he thought it was going to be exactly the same as he remembered it, that his mother would be waiting for him, but there was nobody there. The place was empty. The previous owners had died, but a key holder let them in. 
And for once they said they got into the door, they said Cameron ran all over the place. He knew every bit of the house. He, he showed them the three bathrooms. He showed them the beach view of the, where the airplanes land. And in the garden, he took them to a secret entrance that he had been talking about for years. He was eager to see old family photographs and, and they found somebody by the name of Robertson who had photographs but you know he, he didn't know old relatives and people that had lived and died. Uh, but Cameron had always talked about a big black car and a black and white dog and as they looked through the photographs there was this man with the car and the dog. So they came back to Glasgow and they said Cameron now is, is much calmer. It's put his mind at ease. He no longer talks about Barra. But he knows what, what, what makes him feel good is that he knows that now people don't think he was making things up. And, and, and Norma, his mother, said we didn't get all the answers we were looking for and apparently past life memories fade. But she did say something interesting that he has a very close pal that he plays with all the time and he told his friend don't worry about dying because you just come back again and when, when his mother asked him she said well how did you end up with me he says I fell through and went into your tummy and when I asked him she says what his name was before he said, it was Cameron. It's still me. And she says, I don't think we'll ever get all the answers. Now, Dr. Tucker, who was there and worked on this case, and many others, also, as we've shown you many times, worked on a, on a case of a boy who had a birthmark on his chest, and who had claimed to be lived before and was able to provide the name and location of the person that he was in a previous life. And the investigation of that person turned up this. They found an autopsy report of that person and found that he had been killed by a gunshot wound to his chest. And when they looked at the boy who claimed to have lived before, he had a birthmark right there on his chest. So, you know, there's documentation here. And one of the interesting things that I think uh, was Dr. Tucker uh, was asked about his opinion of reincarnation. Now, remember, this is a psychologist... Uh, who follows in the footsteps of the late Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia. And what they do is they uh, investigate a children who have said they've lived in a previous life and who can provide some documentation. And this is what uh, Dr. Tucker said. After reviewing many of the strongest cases we have, the best explanation for them is that memories and emotions at times seem to be able to carry from one life to the next. So I think the evidence is there to support reincarnation. So he would join with the Voltaires and Emersons and, and all of these other minds, but he's very much alive and very much active and very much uh, in residence at a prestigious university, the University of Virginia. But now as to his personal opinion, he says, if you're asking, is it part, reincarnation, is it part of my personal belief system? Not particularly. I'm not a Buddhist or Hindu or anything like that. I'm open to the possibility, obviously, or I wouldn't be spending time on this research. But I'm not a zealot as far as pushing some sort of religious doctrine. Which, you know, it, it is... So what all this means is that there is mounting evidence for the fact that the ideas about reincarnation do not come from the scientific mind. Pastors don't believe in it. Most 
doctors and lawyers and most scientists. Don't. But where does it come from? It comes from a child. What you read about is that memories of a past life will be more often expressed by a child starting at the age of three or four. But as the person ages, the memories fade. And that is why the emphasis of the work at the University of Virginia and Dr. Tucker and Dr. Stevenson was built around children. Look. Once in a blue moon, occasionally, there will be adults who contact us and say, when I was a child, I remembered this. And usually, the memories will leave by the time the child is six or seven. But occasionally, they will persist. So we will get people who say, oh, I've had this memory since childhood. Three years of age is usually the age when people begin to speak about past life memories. All right? Now, when we get to this point, I, I find that it is important to try and connect what seems to be difficult for most people to accept and the reality of the existence of so much in reality that mortals know nothing about. You know, well, what I'm saying is, you're watching and yeah, you're saying, I don't know if I believe this. But the point is, you don't know anything as to what is going on in places outside of NBC or CBS or Fox News or whatever. You have no idea. Because they never talk to these people. See? And, and, and if you really were to sit down and instead of talking to a religious person who has no idea whatsoever about this stuff other than what he was taught and reads in a Bible, if you were to sit down with, say, some of the most eminent uh, education, ed educators in the country or in the world, you would hear things like this. And this is something I've shown you before. It comes from Paul Steinhardt who's the Einstein Emeritus Professor at Princeton. For years, parallel universes were a staple of the Twilight Zone. Science fiction writers love to speculate on the possible that, a possibility that other universes might exist. They said, one, Elvis Presley might be still alive somewhere, or the British Empire might still be going strong somewhere. And then he continues, serious scientists dismiss all this speculation as absurd. But now it seems the speculation wasn't absurd enough. Parallel universes really do exist. And they are much stranger than even the science fiction writers dared to imagine. Now, are you going to sit there and say, well, my past... I, I'll be quite frank with you. If I'm in a conversation and your pastor's on one side and Professor Steinhardt's on the other side, I'm going to listen to him. See? So, if you, you know, and I'm not telling you this stuff because I have no clue. But I'm able to, to find people that do have a clue. And this guy says... Hey, reality is stranger than even the science fiction writers dare to imagine. And they dare to imagine some pretty wild stuff. So if you want a scientific explanation, and, and that to me is very important. You say, well, okay, you're saying reincarnation is possible and all this stuff. Or you say, is there a scientific explanation as to how this could happen. Not that, you know, God did this or what. How, you know, let's go back to Dr. Tucker. Jim Tucker, University of Virginia. The physical universe is not what it seems to be. From what we can tell from quantum mechanics, and at least on a quantum level, it seems to be dependent on our observation of it. Quantum physicists talk about electrons or events being potential rather than actual 
physical entities. So that there are various potentials, basically, until somebody looks. See, you come into this building, and the potential is this room. But if nobody sees it, it doesn't exist. But you say, well, I know it exists because it's in there. No, not until somebody sees it. And so the potential all of a sudden becomes reality when it's observed. So that there are various potentials basically until somebody looks. And then it sort of forces the universe to make a determination about which potential is going to be actualized. I don't quite understand that, but you know, nonetheless that's there. So let's see then as he, you know, gets ready to conclude here. Consciousness. Now this is so important. And I see so many people say, oh, the brain. And I say, people will say, oh, you know, I have to uh, meditate and I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do that. So you're using your brain. So it's all, it doesn't work. Consciousness is not just a byproduct of a physical brain, but is actually a separate entity in the universe that has a big impact. So it's separate. The consciousness is not in here. It's here. It has a big impact on the things in here. And there are people looking at the idea of how in a quantum way consciousness can affect the physical brain. Now he says something. You ever read when Jesus said, if you have ears to hear? Well, what uh, Dr. Tucker says, if you're open to that. If you're open to that possibility... If you are truly going to consider the fact that consciousness is a separate entity in the universe, then you have to consider the possibility that consciousness is not dependent on just being a byproduct of a functioning brain. It's going to continue after the brain dies. And once again, I say if you're watching and you say this is wild, weird, or you call him up, argue with him, or call up Dr. Steinhardt at Princeton and you know, tell them how smart you are. So you see, though, why people have trouble with this. They have never been exposed to the minds that study the invisible, so they call it the spiritual. And instead, the masses of people have subjected their minds and their brains to the teachings of the religious who have no concept of this stuff. What it means basically is that we have been trained in religion to consider something as spiritual when actually it is subatomic electrical reality. And it also means that there's no way that anybody can die. But you know what? It is only the child who is going through that point of remembrance who knows this. So the child will spin and the parent will say, stop. And then what happens to the child? The child has to make his or her way to their secret place where he or she can carry on conversations with their invisible friends who we insist are not there. Thank you for being with us tonight. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the Hidden Meanings Conference Center. We're located...